Hi, I'm Caroline Stocks with Poultry Health Today and with me is Ashley Peterson who's Vice President of Science and Technology at the National Chicken Council. Thanks ever so much for joining us. Uh, today you're going to give us an update on um, Salmonella and Campylobacter. Looking first at Salmonella, what progress is the industry making in meeting the US USDA's FSIS um, regulations around Salmonella? Well, that's a, that's a great question. Um, the industry's done a great job both on whole birds and chicken parts, which is how we are regulated. Uh, the performance standard for whole birds um, on salmonella is 9.8%. And as an industry, we're at about 4.5%, so less than half of that performance standard, which is really good. Um, on chicken parts, um, we're doing a great job. As you probably know, in 2016, we had a new performance standard for salmonella on chicken parts at 15.4%. Um, when you look back before um, that performance standard was put into place, as an industry, we were about 25%. And now we are less than 10%. So below the performance standard, well below the 25% baseline that the agency calculated a handful of years ago. So as an industry, making great progress on salmonella. If you look at how the industry is categorized, um, as you may know, the industry is categorized in categories one, two, and three. Uh, category three establishments are not meeting the performance standard. And so for whole birds, there's only about 10% of plants that aren't meeting the performance standard on whole birds and about 12% that aren't meeting it on um, chicken parts. So again, great success stories and we continue to just really do a good job of getting our hands around controlling salmonella. You spoke to us last year about salmonella infantis which had seen a, a significant outbreak. Of the 70 plus uh, places where it was found, um, it was the same genome sequence which you said at the time was, was quite unusual. Has there been any progress in understanding where it's come from and is it still being found? It is still being found. Um, I think as an industry, um, we've looked at some of our intervention strategies, whether that's through um, implant interventions or on-farm interventions through the use of autogenous vaccines. Um, I, I believe as an industry, we have seen a reduction in that, but as we all know, with salmonella, you get rid of one or you reduce one, and another one is more than happy to take its place. Um, so while we, we are seeing some shifts in Infantis, it's only a matter of time before you know another one, and we've seen an uptick in Schwarzengrün, for example, which is one that we haven't talked about in the broiler industry as, as far as I can remember. And so now that one you know, is potentially creeping up. So again, we have to watch them all. The agency regulates all of them equally. And so again, we, our job as an industry is to reduce all salmonella. Okay, so turning to Campylobacter, which has had quite a lot of attention recently, can you tell us what happened when the FSIS moved to a more sensitive testing program? Yes, absolutely. Well, it all really started back when the agencies went from the buffered peptone water to the neutralized buffered peptone water as a result of some concern about antimicrobial carryover, and that happened in July of 2016. Once that happened, the agency saw and the industry saw a significant shift in Campylobacter rates and they went way down. Uh, and that led the agency to do some investigation and realize that, you know, perhaps that neutralized buffered peptone water was impacting the Campylobacter, so they went to that direct plate, uh, or so, sorry, the enrichment method, which is much more sensitive than the direct plate. As a result of that, if you look at the data, you know, the industry went to probably 5% to 25% in a matter of months. So what the agency did then is take a step back and say, okay, we're gonna develop a new performance standard around that. The agency did come out um, in late summer with a comminuted or ground performance standard for turkey and chicken for Campylobacter at 9.8%. Um, we have not seen the new performance standard for Campylobacter on um, chicken parts um, and whole birds yet, but we expect to see that probably in the second quarter of this year. We hear that the methods for controlling salmonella and uh, in live production might not also control Campylobacter. How does that impact the industry and how do they go about actually addressing that issue then? Yeah, I think it's going to be a, a really interesting challenge for the industry, not only in live side, but also in the production plant or in the processing plant and trying to determine how these different bacteria react, whether that's to vaccine pressures, whether that's to um, litter treatments, whether that's to feed additives what or, or antimicrobials that we use in the processing plant. One of the challenges that we have on Campylobacter is that there isn't a vaccine for that right now. 
And that's really an opportunity for some of our allied companies to help us with that because if we could get a, a, a Campylobacter vaccine that, that worked and helped us reduce the load of Campylobacter going into the processing plant, I think that would really help us with the prevalence. So what would uh, companies have to do to try and improve the situation? Well, again, there's, there's a, there are a lot of opportunities. I think um, as an industry, we have a lot of different, um, well, we have several antimicrobials that we can use in the processing plant, use different concentrations, using different pHs. One of the challenges that we have as an industry is we may want to try a new intervention, but if we try a new intervention and that does not work, USDA is still, still taking samples. Let's say you change your pH or you, you change your antimicrobial and now all of a sudden USDA comes in and takes a sample and you get positive salmonella. Well, that's going to count against your performance standard. So we've asked the agency for a little bit of time to trial some of these new interventions to see if they work for both salmonella and campylobacter and that's still an opportunity that we continue to pursue. Looking ahead to the next five years, say, where do you think the industry is going to be in terms of um, meeting the FSI FSIS standards around campylobacter and salmonella? I think we'll continue to see reductions. Um, we, we've done a really good job over the last, since 2006, once the agency started publishing the data. Um, one thing to note is that um, the agency has, has done some changes, as we've talked about in the past, about how they um, calculate where you are at, or calculate your category. And so um, back in 2016, they went to that 13, 52 week window, which essentially meant that there were 65 weeks of data that they would publish. Prior to that, they would do it by quarter. So you could really see the changes in Seminel and Campylobacter rates because again, they only did three months worth of data and that was really helpful. Thankfully, the agency did go back because they have kind of changed um, how they're calculating categories and now they're posting information by quarter. So from 2016 to 2019, they did not have that available until um, last month and that's been really good because again now we can see those fluctuations by quarter because as you know salmonella and campylobacter can be influenced by season um, and so again that that has been that has been really good but i think we'll continue to make great progress and um, you know again we've got to work with our with our allied members to help provide intervention strategies whether that's on the farm or in the processing plant and and we'll continue to make progress and make a safe food great Okay, that was really interesting. Thanks ever so much for talking to us today. Absolutely. I'm Caroline Stocks with Poultry Health today, and I've been talking to Ashley Peterson, who's Vice President of Science and Technology at the National Chicken Council.